Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, Dave tells me about how dinosaur scientific papers are made and why we can trust them. Plus, zoologist Simon Watt and Dave have a little debate about how dinosaurs learn to fly. Hello, welcome to Terrible Lizards. Now today, Dave is possibly held the most exciting of all <laughs> possible podcast subjects to do. But what are we doing, Dave? So I want to talk about how scientific papers actually get published. Oh my God, I'm asleep already. Yeah. I'm asleep. Mm. I'm asleep. So yes, at one level, it's obviously not particularly dinosaur-y, though obviously I'm going to try and draw some examples from stuff that I've done. But I do think it's important as part of talking about dinosaurs and science and knowledge and understanding, like how we actually get there. Because I think for a huge number of the public, it is a complete mystery what scientists actually do. Or at least in terms of, you know, when you read in the news or see on TV, you know, scientists have published a new paper. What the hell does that actually mean? And I think very few people understand that. Certainly, I had no idea of it, even going through most of my undergraduate studies, because no one ever explained it to me. So even people with science degrees, I think, often have a pretty poor understanding of what it actually involves. And therefore, I think it's worth talking about. It's one of those things which we've touched on in podcast so far. Is there are things where you occasionally say, well, I know this because I've seen a thing, but it's yeah. not written anywhere. So it's not true. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on, just, cause, just write it down now, Dave. Just write it down now. Yes, it's 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 obviously not that simple, and it, and it's kind of got more complicated in recent years because of how things um, are going online. Um, so probably jumping ahead of ourselves, but there's now a thing called preprints where people will basically put things online that haven't been vetted, and therefore how accurate and how appropriate is it to discuss those? Um, but I think it all ties together. You know, we keep talking about Nano Tyrannus. I try not to, but it keeps coming back. Um, and there's a great example of that because actually it was just coming up in my Twitter feed about five minutes before we were doing this with Nanotronus was coming back. And- You're dating when we're recording this. Yeah, I know. And, you know, there's discussion about this specimen that's called Baby Bob. And someone online was kind of going, oh, but what about the Baby Bob specimen? Because that proves X, Y, and Z. And it's like, right, but no scientist has seen it. Uh, You know, everything we've heard about this specimen comes from a couple of photos of it that the owners put online and a couple of things they've said about it. And and that's it. Like, you know, you can't verify this information. You can't test it. You can't check it. No, what, you know, I'm not accusing the the owner of of anything underhand, but like he obviously has a vested interest in his specimen you know there's there's certainly no independence on what's going on with those reports and that's not the equivalent just not a good basis for science are there there equivalent of instagram filters for dinosaurs then (laughs) (laughs) i'm just gonna make my bone a bit longer for this just to interest the paleontologist but but this is this is ultimately what a lot of this comes down to this goes back to previous stuff we've talked about with access to specimens and private ownership is you know the verification if someone says i've got this t-rex specimen and this bone is this long but i'm not going to let anyone look at it and i'm not going to show you it well how do you know <laughs> you know what, what is the trust op- well, surely <laughs> the best of us make mistakes all the time in our papers because it's just so easy to make a typo or write something down wrong or misremember something or misconstrue something that someone says to you uh you go oh well he said that it's this and he's like, ah, no, he meant that. And so, you know, there's a general statement that science is self-correcting. And part of that comes because we do make mistakes and we need to be able to fix them. And of course, that cannot happen in those circumstances. And so that's why verification of science even before it's published and also verification of specimens on which those publications are based is kind of important. So... Uh... Give me an example then. You, you're writing a pilot. I mean, do you ever, I suppose you must, because there's, there's two things that you talk about. One is you talk about uh, um, items being described. Mm. And that is that different to a paper being published about them? No, not necessarily. So in in general, you've got there's there's kind of three tiers, if you like, of scientific literature. So the first is what, can we can we reference it to a cake because that will interest me more. So can we say, <laughs> and can you also? I want a flavour of the cake with the jam <laughs> and icing. Yes. <laughs> I'll actually kind of go 
back to front. So we have the primary literature, the secondary literature, and the tertiary literature. I'll start with the tertiary okay. literature, because that's what people are actually probably familiar with. And that would be things like popular science books and potentially newspaper articles, if they're, if they're very well done, or certainly things like New Scientist, Wikipedia, encyclopedias, and the like. And the little labels by the dinosaurs themselves in the museums. <laughs> Um, count as tertiary? I'm, I'm not sure that would count as literature because th- these are all still verifiable and referenceable sources. So that's a, a, a key part of all of this. You know, if I say here is the definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, you you know, but I would say Oxford English Dictionary, sh- abridged version, volume two, page 278, you could go and get hold of that exact same book in a library and check word for word what I've just said. And that is the important part of this is the verification and the document of it. But t- this is tertiary literature. It's it's usually written by non-experts who have usually not read original primary sources. And it's generally pretty accurate, actually. But of course, it tends to get out of date quite quickly and it will be simplified and non-technical and people won't necessarily um, have studied it in great detail. Then you've got the secondary literature, which is sometimes called the grey literature. And there's not much of that, but I'd say something like your typical uh, text book is secondary literature. It's often written by a real expert in the subject who has looked at the primary literature and the original science, but it's there to be read by people who aren't necessarily super experts in the subject. Um, And it's still not necessarily reviewed. No one else has looked at it necessarily beyond the person who actually wrote it. He might be an expert, but he hasn't had anyone else check it and verify it. Um, There's a few kind of popular science textbooks which kind of fall into that category when they're a bit more technical. So in the in the context of, of our podcast, of course, there's a book called The Complete Dinosaur. There's a second edition came out about 10 years ago, and there's a third edition due pretty soon. That I would call grey literature or, or, or secondary. It's got loads and loads of scientific references, and it's written by loads and loads of experts, but it's, it's all still kind of a review and a synthesis. And then you've got the primary literature, which is what I really want to talk about today. And that's ultimately what... That's the frosting, what you're, what, what, what the frosting? Yes, what your question comes down to. And that's like... This is basically new knowledge. It is being generated by scientists. Uh, Scientists also still write review papers. I do that as well. I've written quite a few reviews. But mostly uh, the primary literature is new original knowledge. I have found this new specimen and I'm going to describe its anatomy. I have looked at these two different things which people have already described, but I'm going to compare them and see if they're similar or different. I'm going to look at, for dinosaurs, growth rate or their tooth structure or how they fed or what their behavior is or their evolutionary history or any of these other things or I think this person has done a bad job I'm going to try and correct them all of this stuff is is primary literature it's new created knowledge written by scientists and importantly this is almost universally reviewed by other scientists so when you see a paper published often lots of people disagree with it very heavily Uh, that's kind of an inevitability when you have a huge spread of people with different knowledge under understanding and opinions and backgrounds on things but at a certain level two at least two and often these days three or even four other scientists who work in that field have looked at this paper very very carefully often more than once and in collaboration with an editor who not necessarily, but quite often is also an expert in the subject, has reached the decision that on balance your paper is worthy of publication because basically it is, I wouldn't say correct, but it is... Adding to the knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's a good bit of science. Okay, who decides what the scientists are going to write about? I I know, for example, this is a problem in the medical field because largely the people that can get funding are the people who can get multinational companies in order to do the trials, etc. And so you've got a huge bias into what sells well. So does paleontology suffer from this? Oh, God, yes. I mean, absolutely every field of science and I'd argue every field of academia, though, of course, I can't say much about law and history and the rest. Uh, have that same problem. Um, There are very few researchers out there who are not in some way, shape or form kind of beholden to the the juggernaut that is the the system and their employment. So what is big dinosaur in paleontology? It's not so much that in the pharmaceutical sense that you often see with, you know, medical research, but at the same time, at least in the UK, but in other countries, we have similar systems. And of course, people who are employed by the universities or their museums, that your employer will 
want evidence that the work that you're doing is in some way, shape or form valuable. And it could be because it's a really cool advancement in knowledge. It could be because it's drawn public attention. Um, it could be obviously rarely for paleontology, but it could be generating technological information or changing public opinion on something, or it could feed into a government program in some regard. You know, you could argue things like fossil protection and stuff like this. So basically, they want to see some degree of value. And of course, at least some of that is often driven by public interest. And dinosaurs are sexier than trilobites. And T-Rex is sexier than other dinosaurs. And therefore, you can immediately see that if someone is looking at their research plan for the next two or three years, and they want to be promoted, and their boss or manager or the university as a whole is saying, we want to see stuff that's really engaging and is going to drive a lot of interest and get people on board and is going to get into the more exciting and high-end journals and you've got a choice between doing a study on T-Rex and doing the exact same study on a dinosaur that no one has ever heard of outside of a narrow community which do you think they're going to pick? popular sexy one there we go and so you immediately have these biases in studies some of it is quite what's the word i'm looking for some of it's got almost like a legitimate bias so i think we've mentioned before that t-rex has become something of a model organism that is it has become the standard study at organism for a lot of research mice are a model organism drosophila the the fruit fly is a model organism there's a bunch of them but t-rex has kind of become that for dinosaurs at this point like you've got a positive feedback loop we know probably more about t-rex than almost any other dinosaur so if you're going out to do a brand new trial or a brand new study of some cunning mechanism that you think will reveal something and could in theory be applied to anything but you're going to pick the animal that we know most about because we have the best depth of knowledge and study and all the information available and hopefully make the fewest errors etc so you're going to pick t-rex and then of course that becomes an even more studied animal because this brand new study has just come out explaining another aspect of its biology and so the next person coming along is going to pick t-rex and (laughs) here we go and it you know and things inflate and inflate and inflate so some of those biases are if you like kind of legitimate and inevitable and a consequence of how science tends to work we know more about drosophila than probably all other flies combined but that doesn't mean that everyone's not going to keep working on it But some of it, yeah, it's going to be biases of popularity from the public and funding bodies and all these other places. Um, And that is somewhat linked to the journals that publish them. Um, And in particular, you've got the two like ultimate top tier journals, which are Nature and Science, that I think most people have probably heard of. These are the absolute best possible places that you can publish anything. They have not just a worldwide reach. I think they're about the only thing, certainly in the UK, you could walk into a newsagent and buy them. You can't buy the proceedings of the Royal Society Series B Biological Sciences. You can download them on the Royal Society website, I'm pretty sure. You can, but, it, you know, but it's, it's this thing. It's like, you know, you can buy nature and science on the shelves. And that means that if they've got something that they can stick on the cover, which will make the average consumer, not just a scientist, pick it up and buy it, they are very interested Puffins. in that. And you can see why things like early human research, T-Rex, origin of birds first animals on land, origin of whales, these are topics in paleontology which are extremely exciting to them, but ammonite diversity, maybe not. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, there there is all, there's a horrible kind of tangle of, if you like, quality and originality of research with hype and interest, which is, on balance, probably not for the best for the science and scientists, but that's the system we live in, and as long as people get jobs or are promoted in jobs or get research funding based on such things, they are damn well going to publish on them. Okay, so say you have a paper, right, that you've got an idea of, and it's like T-Rex is a very sexy because it has lots of teeth, and that is your theory, scientific theory, <laughs> uh, and you and you write a lovely paper about this, because obviously the university is very happy because it has the word sexy <laughs> teeth and T-Rex in it, nash, nash, nash they're very happy. Um, that was a reference to the Dennis the Menace. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so oh, should, we should, well, we should probably say at this point for the international audience, the the British have a character called Dennis the Menace who is has the identical name but is completely independent to the American Dennis the Menace. It's a journal called the Beano. Yes. So 
So um, I've got my T-Rex teeth paper. You've got a really good T-Rex teeth paper and your university says, brilliant, go away and we'll give you some funding to write this yeah. or you get some funding from somewhere. The big, big Rex <laughs> pharma- yeah, pharma- pharmaceutical company, company <laughs> wants you to you know, do this. So, I mean, first off, how do you get the funding? Is it the case that you present your idea before you can write the paper or do you write the paper and then hope to get funding for it. Which way does Brown's Well, in, in, in theory, the former. In practice, not necessarily. Um, <laughs> so th- this is another big, you know, contentious issue is, is funding in, in science um, and, you know, kind of proof of concept type stuff uh, because you can understand that scientific funding is limited and they scientific funding bodies don't necessarily want to hand over a ton of money to something with a very low chance of success. And so they want some evidence that you've got this idea or you're going to develop this thing and it's it's actually going to go somewhere, which means you've probably got to do some of the work before you even start to demonstrate that it's worth doing the rest of the work. And that immediately gets you into a chicken and egg situation where I can't do the first bit without the money, but they won't give me the money until I've done it to prove that I can do it. Um, and there, there is certainly a feeling among, I think, many researchers that funding tends to go to projects with a very high chance of success which kind of defeats the object because if you already know what the results are very likely to be do you really want to pump all the money into that there's that old line of it you know if we knew what the answer was going to be we wouldn't do it but at least some of science kind of is heading that way and of course you do still need to test and verify things even if you're really quite sure what they're likely to do and bigger and more complicated analyses of bigger and more complicated systems can give you very unexpected results but I think a lot of times there's a well we're going to work this out well why are you going to do that well here's the last 20 years of research that I've already done in the subject and now I want to do the next bit and it's like well we kind of know where this is going don't we (laughs) at this point of course, lots of research has no funding attached to it at all. Mine doesn't. I don't have time at my office job for research. I basically do it in evenings and weekends and a few spare hours here and there, or I tack it onto things that I'm already doing, or it's based on student projects who've done their research with me as part of their dissertation, and then we try and adapt that and get a paper from it. Whereas many researchers, you know, a huge part of their working lives, you know, is dedicated specifically to having time to read papers and think about what they're doing and setting up experiments and running them and so on. So if you didn't have to teach people, you'd be able to do all the digging. Well, yes, but they, but then the university probably wouldn't pay me if I wasn't doing any of the teaching and just sat in a room doing whatever I wanted. Money is always a problem, <laughs> isn't it? Some people have a lot more time than others. There are lots of bits of research done by all kinds of people, which are, I don't think, this, you know, the science isn't poor, but it's just not particularly exciting. In paleontology, there's quite a lot of that, just documenting new specimens. If you've got a new species, cool, everyone's excited. If you've got a much more complete specimen of something which is only known from bits, lots of people are excited. But it's still worth noting down, you know, what is out there. And I've published a number of papers, particularly some stuff like my bite marks, where it's not much more than going, by the way, there's this specimen and it's got this thing that looks like this. And I think it's probably linked to that, but I'm not sure. But you're just documenting that basic data and getting it out there and accessible for people. Then you just send it through to Bite Mark monthly and they will put it on their website rather than print well, it. Well, yeah. yeah. So, you know, n- nature is not very interested in something like that, strangely <laughs> enough. But we, there's a standard line of, you know, science is built on the shoulders of giants. It, you know, you've got to have that mass of data. Someone who's going to do a big study and look at how bite marks have changed from dinosaurs over time. Well, if everyone's published all the bite mark data that's out there, it's there and you can just access it and use it. And it's verified and checked at some level. That's the, the point of primary publications. And therefore, you know, it becomes an awful lot easier. I spend quite a lot of time when I try and take a trip out to a museum just just opening drawers and just finding what they've got. To remind me to never leave Dave alone in my house. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, but you know, big collections uh, like the American Museum of Natural History or the Natural History Museum in London or places like this, you know, they have loads and loads and loads of fossils. You know, lots of paleontologists come and visit them, but no one has sat down and, you know, there might be a catalogue of like, this drawer has 23 bones of Pteranodon and it will tell you where each one came from and when they bought it and who they bought it off. And it might even have a tentative identification, but it probably contains no other information than that. And you pull the drawer open and go, oh, 
oh, it's a really horrible specimen where almost all the bones are shattered and there's absolutely no information on it. Or you pull the drawer open and go, this is magnificently preserved and I've never seen a wing this good before. And hey, look, it's got that weird little feature that I've only ever seen once before on this other specimen that I saw 10 years ago. Or it's got a bite mark on it. Or it's got a pathology on it. Or, you know, who knows what? No one's got time to do that kind of work. And it's it's down to researchers coming through and finding that information and then putting it out there. And so, yeah, there's lots of small papers, if you like, just doing that kind of basic cataloging work. But it's it's really, really important. I'm pretty sure that what I'm about to say is entirely untrue, but it rings true. So I'm going to say it anyway, which is Irvin Finkel at the British Museum. If you want to study some cuneiform tablets, they've got some really well-preserved mm. um, things, where you know, and look at the translation, everything else. In order to do that, he will give you the real horrible ones to help translate yeah. <laughs> for, because they're still going through them and still trying to make sure that you know. And it's the trouble with cuneiform tablets is it's all shopping lists. And yeah, it's a rubbish. You owe this much tax. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> it's not a nice. It's not a nice diary or an essay or, yeah, no I mean you did find that one which turned out to be like uh, the Noah story about 3,000 years before Noah so oh, yeah, that's quite good <laughs> which is pretty good but um, other than that yeah. yes, it's all a bit um, it's all a bit dire but the, the problem is yeah, it is just you need people to digest and show the information yeah you, you've, you've, you've got to process it and you know and the bigger and bigger studies you know which is happening ever more in paleo partly because the accessibility of stuff being online you know were almost impossible you know 20 years ago because if you wanted a, a data set of you know every single you know every, every single pterosaur if you if you wanted to you could probably just about get a list of every single pterosaur specimen there'd be quite a few thousand of them but you could probably just about do it or certainly make a very very big head start just by collating lists of specimens in research papers and specimen lists from museums that have online databases well 20 years ago all those papers were physical actual paper papers and there was no central database or searchable index of them like there is on google scholar and pubmed and other things like that and museums had databases they were handwritten in books and i know because i used to do that for the natural history museum in one of their departments you couldn't just phone them up and go can you tell me every pterosaur you've got or have you even got any in your collection like this is you know a massive change in in publishing but again that if that if that work isn't done the cool sexy paper that you see of the diversity of pterosaurs changing over time and it's only available because of the this kind of grunt work for want of a better phrase and if you do a phd that is what you're doing <laughs> well it, it, it depends i mean often often phds of course go into real hyper detail because researchers have for the first and quite possibly last time in their lives several years to devote to a single subject um but even then you're often building up basic foundational knowledge to be able to get there and that can involve trawling through dozens of collections and getting hold of finding out what damn specimens are there and if you've gone that far you might as well write a little paper saying oh by the way there's one here and there's by the way there's one here and this is an unusual usual one because it's got an extra thing or whatever so who checks that who marks it who says this is this you are right this is science so this is the review process and that's a really kind of central part to this and when i said you know this is what we talk about peer 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 review it is it is being reviewed and verified by your peers so other scientists the typical procedure is i've written my paper i've got an abstract introduction methods results and discussion i've got figures and graphs and stuff and i find Find a journal that I think is suitable and I will send it off to them with a letter to the editors going, dear editor, here, you know, over just four or five lines. This is what this paper's about. This is what we found. This is why we think it's interesting. This is why we think your journal is a good match for it. If you've completely misjudged it um, or if the journal is very, very busy, so Nature and Science do this a lot, then you get a desk rejection. In other words, the editor writes back and goes, nope. <laughs> and then you send it somewhere else. Um, hopefully what happens at this point is it goes goes out for review. And so the editor will send your paper out to, as I say, anything from two to four colleagues. Two is the most normal. It's very rare. It's fewer than two. Um, it's usually two. It's occasionally three. Sometimes the number gets higher. But researchers who are, if possible, A, working in that exact field, and B, are not people who you normally work a lot with. This, of course, varies massively from 
field to field. I've got, you know, colleagues in my department who publish papers on ecology and things like this. And they've never even heard of any of the people who have reviewed their papers because there's thousands of people in, you know, in animal ecology or whatever. Whereas it's like, well, here's my paper on tyrannosaurs. There's only about eight people who work on tyrannosaurs. I'm one of them. (laughs) And so I have a pretty good guess who it's going to. And as a friend of mine used to work on Eurypterids, uh, sea scorpions, which are much, much, much older, and they're not true scorpions and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but this ancient marine invertebrate group. And uh, he was a guy I was doing my PhD with. And he said, well, there's about three people in the world who work on Eurypterids. There's me. There's my PhD supervisor, who probably shouldn't be reviewing my papers because he's my PhD supervisor. And he's obviously an author in most of them. And then there's this other guy um, that I know in Norway. He supervised my undergraduate program project and got me into Eurypterids. And he probably shouldn't review my papers either. And I'm still working with him on other stuff. And so inevitably, those papers were reviewed by people who don't know very much about Eurypterids, because what choice do you have? You know, I, I think on average, the system is very fair. There are obviously people who can write very nasty, unfair reviews. There are people who probably write unfairly favorable reviews for their friends and colleagues. I can certainly attest to the fact that I have some very close friends and colleagues who've written some coruscating reviews and destroyed some of my papers in review. Um, I think they're wrong, but they're sure as hell not giving me an easy ride because they're friends and collaborators. I've written a stinking review for one of my best friends at one point as well um, because I thought the paper was terrible. So mostly people are really quite honest, though, again, you still try and find people who are not close collaborators or friends or obviously enemies for that matter. Oh, I like the idea of dinosaur paleontology enemies. That is brilliant. I've heard of a fist fight at a paleontology conference. Of course. I have definitely seen people toe to toe and eye to eye and yelling at each other. Um, it, about dinosaurs, though, this isn't that you stole my girlfriend type. Te- thing. No pterosaurs, <laughs> in at least one case. Um, so yeah, it, it it absolutely does happen. Good, good. Uh, so yeah, it will, it goes off to these reviewers. They write their comments and send it back to the journal, and then the editor, who often is a you know is a real expert in the field as well themselves. Again, it depends exactly what journal you send it to, um, and they will look at those reviews and make some kind of decision about the paper. And in general, you've got kind of four categories. The two easy ones is accept as is. In other words, we think this paper is basically brilliant, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, and short of maybe a couple of typos or this figure's a bit ugly just just go ahead it's great and the opposite of that of course is is rejection as in this paper's terrible let it never darken our doorway again how many times has that happened to you how many times oh quite a few (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, I mean, you, so partly you've got to remember it depends on the journal as well you know you you can get favorable reviews saying this paper is really pretty cool and the journal going but no. it is but we wanted something even cooler than that or we think it's going to take quite a lot of work and we want something fast or um you know it it would be stronger if you could do this but then you'd have to write a much more complicated methods and it's too long as it is so you can't yeah um but yeah I've, I've definitely had papers rejected as being we think the science is terrible start again and then by far and away the most common are basically minor revisions and major revisions and minor revisions usually mean there's some problems here but nothing that can't be fixed fairly quickly you know this is great but the, well the the analysis is a bit weak so stick another you know in paleontology terms you know you've got 20 specimens well there's few more out there can you get it to 25 or you didn't measure this problem parameter and that might change a few things so can you just check um and usually if you get something like minor corrections the referees don't look at it again you'd write a letter to the editor going here's the stuff we've changed and here's what we fixed and they'll look over and go yeah that's all fair enough okay you added those extra specimens your it hasn't changed any of your results so we do still have confidence no problem and and through it goes and major revisions which are really quite common which is there's fundamentally something pretty good here but there's also some pretty big problems with it that need work it could be that the writing is terrible and unclear 
it could be more often that the science is at some level not necessarily wrong or unsound because otherwise they'd give you a rejection but you know this needs some work a classic example of that is Chang Tyrannus the, the big Tyrannosaur that I named you know I and my colleagues we wrote a paper we said here's all these features that it's got this is our description here are the features that we think make it clearly different to all other Tyrannosaurs therefore it's a new species therefore we're naming it and this is what we're going to name it and then some other stuff about the implications of biology and ecology and evolution and it came back from two referees both of whom were Tyrannosaur taxonomy experts this is this is kind of my first big foray into Tyrannosaur so I hadn't really worked with any of these people at this point and said well look we agree that this is a new genus and that you should name it but in particular we don't like the characters you're using to diagnose it we think you've misinterpreted some of the anatomy and you've got some details wrong I remember one in particular we talked about the size of the alveoli so the holes that the teeth sit in in the jaw um, and because it was based in China at the time the only although there's lots of papers to access you know real fossils and things you can hold in your hand is obviously much better and we had one cast of a t-rex skull we could work on and we looked at the alveoli and that and go wow they're really really different this is really quite an important feature and someone wrote back and gone ah i think you've looked at x specimen and its alveoli are broken and so they look weird and so you've misinterpreted that and you think it's one thing and it's actually something else if you'd looked at a different specimen you'd have spotted that so you say t-rex has this condition and actually it doesn't at all and obviously when we have when we're diagnosing a new taxon off basically only a couple of bones every little detail is therefore quite important so this was quite a problem that we'd included something which was fundamentally incorrect and this is the peer review process but on the other hand they said yeah but have you looked at this because i'm looking at your photos i'm pretty sure that you've got this feature and i've never seen that in anything else before so that would actually be one back onto your tally that would would help diagnose it um and so yeah both referees gave it a hard time and said there's a lot to work to do that you can improve all of this but the fundamental thing you think you have a new species we think is correct and the interpretation that you've got because it's a new species is correct you just got to really fix this so it was only one part of the paper but obviously it's such a major part that we were told go away and rewrite it so we went away and rewrote it and then it went back to those two referees who looked at it again and went yeah you've got rid of the junk we liked what you've added you fixed a couple of other problems and so yeah and some papers can go through three or even four rounds of review like that at a journal and still ultimately be rejected um, I've, mm. I've heard of papers like that that have been through three four rounds of review and at the end the referees are like you've still you haven't fixed this you've, you've tried to buttress this with a new analysis and that analysis is indistinct you fix that one you know you, you you gave us this analysis but it didn't have enough data you've added data and now it doesn't show the result that you said we, we're just not happy with it um and they can you know kind of collapse at, at that point and i've got several papers which have just kind of died not because they're necessarily bad or wrong or flawed science but because i just can't do all the work that's needed to do and fix these little problems and then the results aren't as exciting as i thought they were it's going to be even more effort and you you do get stuff where people send it back and go your analysis is just wrong like you've measured the wrong thing to show the thing that you want to or you've used the wrong statistical analysis um you know you haven't corrected for x or something like the whole thing is a wash go away and and start again and that happens they also still get published of course because sometimes those authors go no i think i'm right i think those referees are wrong they send it to another journal and a different referee looks at it and goes yeah that's fine mm. and sometimes those are correct i.e., the referee was wrong and the author was right uh, and sometimes they are wrong and they should have listened to the referee and the next referee didn't know and some bad science can be published but that's that self-correcting process and that goes back to that point about being able to verify that data here's my analysis showing your tyrannosaur teeth but it's all based on this specimen that i saw once but the guy won't let anyone else look at it right? mm. how, how do you know it's true how, how how can you prove it how can someone else check it if i've if i have screwed up entirely innocently i i counted 12 teeth when there were 13 or i wrote it down wrong or i used inches instead of centimeters on my scale bar or i misread the figure any of those things that are still innocent um could be wrong and no one can check and that's not good for fixing mistakes this is the criticism that comes in a lot, particularly with more with subjects like psychology, which is somebody does a really lovely experiment 
and everybody goes, oh, this means this. And then a load of science is based off the results. But nowhere can anybody get printed a replication of that experiment to make sure it's not, yeah, you know. Yeah, that, so it's it, very, because part of science is verification as well as um, disproving. So yeah. the, is that also a problem the, in paleontology? I think less so in paleo because so much more of that data is readily available. And certainly for a lot of, you know, for a lot of things we're working on fairly simple data, in fact, really, you know, is this species present or absent? How long is this bone? How many vertebrae does it have? What's the curvature of the, the teeth? What's the density of the bone? Those are definite. Those are, those the, yeah, are quantitative. The, yeah, yeah. They're, they're fairly quantitative. They're fairly hard to get too badly wrong. Outliers usually stick out, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. You can do, you can gather an awful lot of that data through little more than sitting and Googling and processing and getting hold of stuff. Um, but yes, there is generally understood to be a replication problem in science and psychology is, I think, particularly notorious for this. And it goes back to that funding body thing. If someone spent a million quid doing a really big, cool analysis and then and comes up to a really good result and then the first thing someone turns around and go well your results are extraordinarily impressive and convincing and it's a brilliant analysis done very well but you know you might have done it wrong or just by chance you might have randomly selected your 50 volunteers may not have been part of the average so i'm going to do it again i need a million quid now to do the exact same thing uh, and the chances are that the results i'll get will be identical to the one you just spent a million quid on you can see why why people aren't rushing to, to throw money at them. Um, okay. And that is kind of a problem. And, and also that verification problem. The, the other one is the idea of negative results are not interesting. Um, mm. And so there's a lot, there's... Tyrannosaurs didn't have wings. Well, right. But, you know, we, we tested whether or not X correlates with Y. Oh, it turns out it doesn't. That's really, I mean, that's, that's knowledge, but it's not very exciting. Um, and so there's a general understanding that lots of work like that tends not to be published, which is, of course, unfortunate because sooner or later someone else is going to try and do the same analysis and come to the exact same conclusion and they won't publish it either. And then two different lots of people have wasted their time doing something. And then a third, because they still haven't read either of the first two who, who did that. Um, there is a journal of negative results. and it, it, I was going to it, say, that's a website that needs to happen, it, it, surely. It, it, it's not like it's flooded with submissions, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, there, there are absolutely problems in the publication process with biased referees. I mean, I mean outside of outright cheating, um, there was someone caught not too long ago who was basically um, created fictional referees, uh, created fictional scientists and gave them websites and made up email addresses for them and then sent his papers to journals and said, well, here's a list of ref potential referees you could speak to, um, none of whom I've ever collaborated with. Well, of course not, because they don't exist. Um, and the editor looks and finds their web page. And, oh, yeah, he looks like a real expert in this subject. And no, he's never worked with that guy before. And OK, yeah, I'll, I'll send him an invitation. And it was the same guy. So this guy was getting his own papers to review by creating these false referees. And then, of course, writing glowing reviews of these amazing research papers. And the journals were publishing them until he got caught. Um, that, that, I mean, that's someone just cheating. That's not a bias in the system. That's someone just being unbelievably underhand. I think some humanity subject, there were some guys who famously were writing very, what they considered woke papers, trying to look at, um, how, uh, I think like gender identity and dog walking was, was a thing. And they, they really made ridiculous spoof. Yeah. Feminism, the art of bird watching, that yeah. sort of stuff. And they all got taken really seriously and published in these humanities journals and they revealed it and everybody got very cross. Yeah. There's lots of people who are who have done things to kind of spoof journals like that to show that there are problems. But they draw some attention, but I'm not sure they don't show some flaws that we don't already know are out there. Yeah. I've I've definitely had a couple of papers where I've sent them to journals and the editors have said, We don't know what to do with this well so i've done stuff like pterosaur flight and so you send it into a paleontology journal and they go yeah curiously enough i don't know anyone who works on flight dynamics and aeronautical theory um okay well we'll send it to an aeronautical journal and they go who the hell do you think we know knows about the fossilization process of pteranodon and the biases in wing structure yeah, right and 
these intersectional papers can get weirdly trapped like that. Um, and so I have some sympathy with the idea that a paper that is at some level attached to a field, but ultimately is from a very, very different one, can sneak into a journal because people are not in a position to handle it properly. Um, those are kind of separate issues. But yeah, there are biases in people don't publish negative results. People can overhype their papers. Editors are... Uh, selective, um, you know, referees can have, um, you know, can do underhanded things. I've definitely heard of referees who hold papers up. So, you know, you get the paper to review. They've got their own bit of research. Well, if, you've got that first. Yeah, my, my, I know my paper's going to be out in the next few weeks. So if I just sit on this for two or three weeks before I write my review, just to make sure they're slowed up just enough that mine comes out first. Um, yeah. Or, oh, that's a very good idea. Oh, and my students nearly finished their analysis. I wonder if they can change their analysis in the next couple of weeks. Mm. So some of which, as I say, is just straight up dishonesty. Some of which is some inherent biases, some of which are easier to counteract than others. But ultimately, in theory, at this point, if you've been through your multiple rounds of review, through your multiple different referees and potentially had an argument with the editor about just how right or right wrong the referees are, the referees' words are not taken as gospel. You write to the editor and go, he says that I should have done this kind of analysis, but he's wrong. This kind of statistic is appropriate for this kind of data set. I had one ages ago where the referee said, oh, you know, you've, you say you've analysed every specimen available, but I know of dozens that you've missed. And I wrote back and went, well, he doesn't because here is is the catalogue and the referee never actually provided a list of these other specimens that I've allegedly missed and you can point to the fact the other referee said brilliant job you've encumbered every specimen I'm aware of so it's like well he thinks I've got all of them well you shouldn't do the magic made up I mean the magic was the other guy knew so See, yeah, uh, what if what if in his house he had all the others well quite you know, and, and on that same subject, you know, referees can disagree profoundly with each other. I've I've seen papers as as an author, as a referee, and even as an editor. I have been an editor at various times where one referee comes back and says, this paper's unbelievably brilliant. And another one comes back and says, this one's awful. And at that point, you usually send it to a third referee to find out what they think and hopefully get some kind of majority opinion. And I've, I've seen that swell out of control till it's ended up with like five referees on a paper because everyone disagrees with everyone else. So ultimately what we're saying is th 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 there is a lot of humanity involved yeah, the, in the science. There absolutely is. But I think the, the, I guess the important point that I wanted to make clear is, you know, that there is real verified science that's been checked by people. There are absolutely papers that are published which are terrible science. The fundamental concept is wrong. The methods are wrong. The results are therefore wrong. The conclusions drawn from the results are wrong, even if everything else was right they then drew the wrong conclusion from it and the referees didn't notice or said it wasn't that important or the editor didn't notice or overruled what the referees got and yada yada, yada. terrible terrible science does get published but at the bare minimum if you've got a scientific paper published in a peer-reviewed journal that's been through proper peer review it's been looked at by two or three of your colleagues often more than once and the editor who's often an expert in that subject and there's been a big argument and a debate about about it and at the bare minimum they've gone yeah this passes the basic tests this is proper data collected properly and analyzed and published properly and yeah it might still be flawed but compared to this bloke said what i read on the internet i heard from someone that peer-reviewed papers are really pretty solid and good arguments and i think also from this we need to show that disagreement is vital in science and also being able to change your mind about certain things is vital with science and with that oh, yeah. in mind i have i have for you now the wonderful scientist zoologist creator and performer and wondrous thing of the ugly animal preservation society it is simon watt here he is i for about three years worked at the natural history museum which as my wife calls the dinosaur museum which annoys everybody mm. who works at the natural history museum i'm sure it does <laughs> You know, that's proper niche trolling. If you know what to call the Natural History Museum, the Dinosaur Museum, that's even worse to call the Science Museum, the Dinosaur Museum. That winds them up even more. <laughs> that are confusing one. 
<laughs> Excellent. I was lucky when I was at the Natural History Museum, I did a bit of work with, do you know Louis Ray? I know Louis very well, yeah. That's him. Okay, so Louis, um, he is a fantastic dinosaur artist. And he and his ilk, I suppose, are starting to take over the whole dinosaur illustration world and adding things. I think, was he the first person to add a wattle to Quite dinosaur? possibly. I mean, he's, he's uh, for, for people who don't know Luis, he's famous for doing uh, kind of out there dinosaur reconstructions. And I don't mean that in a, they're inaccurate, um, but he's he was very happy to speculate on soft tissue before other people did. So all kinds of, yeah, turkeys and big antelope and things have all kinds of bits hanging off their face. Faces, but people would always just draw dinosaurs as a very straight-laced lizard kind of face. And Luis was the first person to go, no, let's go mad. Mm-hmm. What? Some of them could be bright pink. Some of them could have mad stuff hanging off their faces or inflatable throat pouches and, and things like this. And while a fair number of artists do that now, I, I agree with you. I think he was probably the first person to really push those buttons and start illustrating stuff like that. Well, I, I know his work then. I know some of his sort of contemporaries and i know there's a a fantastic book where they try to draw the least likely but not provably incorrect dinosaurs they could to show that in our images of them we tend to view them almost like shrink wrapped and like if you just shrimp like something like a blue whale or or yeah they look very weird that was a book that became called all yesterdays is the one you're thinking? Yep, yeah, is the one you're thinking of. Um, and so that was uh, Darren Nash, a paleontologist, who I know listens to this. So hello, Darren. Uh, John Conway, a paleo artist, and the two of them do a podcast together called Tet Zoo. And if I'm saying his name right, Mimo Kozman, who's a Turkish artist and biologist, um, and they they did a book on that, which was an idea. I don't think I'm wrong in saying though. Darren may be very unhappy that lots of paleontologists had talked about themselves before, but certainly those three were obviously really pushing it, and then produced this book of as you say not you know not provably incorrect even though some of them were at the edges of plausibility for dinosaur reconstruction and to try and show that it's not just you know big lizardy animals or big birdy animals uh, which is what a huge amount of contemporary paleo art was even 10 years ago i'm trying to think when their book came out now probably 10 years ago <laughs> a massive apology is ian and david here because i'm fully aware that uh, i haven't even asked the question yet. i just required so much context in order to ask it. <laughs> is it can i borrow your book yeah <laughs> <laughs> well bearing in mind that that's now happened and it happened now quite a while ago how long until the general populace catches up so oh that is a good question um who knows is the obvious answer um so we we had a question on a little session that is united on youtube a few weeks ago and someone kind of asked what what do you think will take to make the next step forward, which is a obviously similar but different question to what you just asked. And and my slash our answer was kind of, I think it needs to be a big film because you look at things like King Kong in the 30s and then Harryhausen in the 60s and 70s and then Jurassic Park in the 90s all were big enough cultural things to kind of drag people forwards. And so I think until something like that happens again where, you know, tens of millions of people worldwide would see it and then come to expect it, I'm not sure how that's going to happen because there's been, you know, so many series and one-offs and specials in the last 10, 15 years, including stuff that I've consulted on, including stuff that all kinds of different colleagues and friends who have that same general opinion and, and that idea that we've been far too conservative and we should be more out there with these. And yet I don't think the public opinion has really shifted to that, even though it's been shown dozens of times now. Okay, it is commonly known now that, of course, the, the birds come from the dinosaurs and that they're the same kind of lineage. Yeah. But what is less commonly known, I suppose, is that Archaeopteryx, the first bird, ain't the first bird. No, almost certainly not by by quite a big margin as well. So I'm wondering, because I'm out of date on this stuff now. Yeah. What was the because because like I, I wrote an article for like a I think it was the Times years back about nope, it's definitely not this one. It could be this, yeah. it could be this, and it could be this. And I'm out of date. I've lost the consensus. So what is the first bird now? Do we have any idea? <laughs> Well, Archaeopteryx is still a, is still a credible one in in that regard. So, well, Archaeopteryx, in the way that you're probably familiar with it, and most people are, 
is now almost certainly three or four different species. So there's now, well, 14 specimens, something like that, have come out of southern Germany, where the original first two or three specimens came from. So there's the the London one, which anyone who's been to the UK has seen that on display. The Berlin specimen is the really famous one that you see on absolutely everything. Those are the two most important. But there's a bunch of others, and they've been split into various different species and even new genera. Um, So that already smears things around a bit more. Um, And basically, you've got three groups coming out all almost simultaneously at at the kind of very derived part of carnivorous dinosaurs. You've got the birds themselves, or the lineage which ultimately goes on to produce birds, but we'll call that birds for convenience. You've got the dromaeosaurs, which is Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Microraptor, and a few other things that people have probably heard of. And then the Truodontids, um, Truodon being the most famous and and a bunch of others. And those three groups have traditionally been very hard to separate, as in, we don't exactly know, are birds closer to dromaeosaurs, or are birds closer to truodontids, or are truodontids and dromaeosaurs closer to each other? We we can't basically tell them apart. As you go further back in time, of course, they get more and more similar, and our fossils get fewer and more fragmentary, and then it just falls into a bit of a mishmash. On top of that, several people have suggested that Archaeopteryx and its nearest relatives, which then gets called the Archaeopterigid day, I think, um, might be their own little radiation and therefore not necessarily part of birds or either of those two others. And then there's a thing called Anchiornis, which I helped name, though I didn't do much of the original paper, um, from China from the middle Jurassic, so quite a bit older. Uh, and we originally described that as a truodontid, but now people have said, well, no, there's Anchiornis and a few other things, and there's this Anchiornis group, which might be its own separate radiation radiation. So we've gone from there are three groups and we can't quite separate them to there are three or four or five groups and we can't quite separate them. And Archaeopteryx is, is basically bouncing around. Archaeopteryx and its relatives are basically bouncing around. And so in some people's analyses, they do still come out as the first thing on that bird branch that we're very happy is there after that ultimate bird lineage to split off. And therefore, arguably, Archaeopteryx is still the first bird, but other things don't find them as birds at all and find them in a different not very different but a different part of the tree and therefore are no longer birds in which case several other things become options but those things themselves are also bouncing around between the different groups in the different analyses so there's basically no simple answer i don't think it's unreasonable to say that archaeopteryx is still a credible candidate which turns up in a number of analyses as being the first bird but whereas 10 years ago that was a nailed on certainty and everyone knew that and understood that and there was no contention or disagreement over it i mean i I don't really work on that area i couldn't tell you if 20 percent of people reckon that or 80 percent of people reckon that but it's it's clearly still definitely in the mix um but there's yeah just so many damn things now all of which are well preserved all of which have got feathers all have got which have got very early bird-like characters but also truodontid characters and dromaeosaurid characters and are it's just kit and caboodle and it they're just they're just all the same <laughs> And obviously, I don't literally mean that for anyone listening, complaining, going, good God, can't you tell these? About-? Yes, of course we can, but it's, it's complicated. But does does that mean then, so like in the way that, like say, maybe a weird analogy, the way that we have uh, mammals are so-called because of mammary glands, breasts and stuff, yeah. it's, actu- <laughs> it's actually our jaws which really distinguish us, really. You know, the single jaw thing. And, and, really. the, and the inner ear bones and related yeah. stuff, yeah. Well, this was that's it. The inner ear bones are the shape they Have are come because off, of the yeah. jaw. Yeah. So, look, that's that makes sense to us, but it's not the one people know. So, am I right then in thinking that these early birds, be it Archaeopteryx and its kin, is it still that we're looking at flight as flight is the thing that makes a bird? Are we looking for asymmetric feathers on them, which is a sign of flight, or is it there's something primitive to that? Yeah. So, so a well, for, worse. So worse. Bleh, mm, and cut that uh, bit. Um, I won't. So, <laughs> cheers. We talked about this in a previous episode. You know what what paleontologists are doing, and indeed biologists are doing with it, with all kinds of other groups, is 
we look at everything as far as possible to determine what those evolutionary groups really are. And then once we've worked out what species do or do not fall within those groups, we try and find unifying, convenient characters which are good for diagnosing them. But of course, people look at it backwards and think that they're a bird because they have this feature. And it's kind of not, it's the other way around. We've worked out that they're all part of one evolutionary lineage. All of that lineage has this feature. Therefore, we're using that feature to define it. Um, I think in that context, it's kind of coincident that all of these things are, all of these things that we're discussing at this very basic split probably are powered flyers. But even that is somewhat contentious. Archaeopteryx in various different analyses has been shown to be a true flyer and capable of launching and being a powered flyer like a modern bird or a bat. Other people say, no, it's really terrible and it could probably barely get off the ground and maybe actually it was more of a a glider. So even that we don't really know for sure. If it was flying, it clearly wasn't great. Certainly the asymmetric feathers have been argued as as being like the feature which define flight, which is probably not true. Um, there's been some analyses, certainly Mike Habib I know has worked on this, suggesting that it's not just asymmetry. I was going to ask what, what, what if, are if, asymmetry? If, you get, if you get a big wing feather off a pigeon or something yeah. like that, or, or just see or them, see them in the park. Thick. Yeah, yeah, you've got the shaft up the middle and then there's a thick side and a thin side. It is asymmetric and that is forming some something of an airfoil so like when you look at the classic drawing of a wing in cross section it's kind of a very extended teardrop so it's got a short end and a narrow end with a thick bit near the front um and things like archaeopteryx and all modern birds have asymmetric feathers and that's been used as an argument to show that archaeopteryx is a pretty good flyer the thing is what mike has pointed out is that actually it has to be really asymmetric before it's very effective and slight asymmetry which is what archaeopteryx has got it's not even both sides but it's not massively can to one side probably don't give you very much lift at all then becomes well how good a flyer was it and as we said it's quite possible archaeopteryx is a different branch in which case did flight evolve twice well it definitely did because pterosaurs fly (laughs) well right yes but but, um, among that burst of bird-like evolution if archaeopteryx and its relatives are true flyers and if they are not on that bird lineage but come out further down then either flight evolved twice or flight evolved evolved once and was then immediately lost in the dromaeosaurs and truodontids because none of them are powered flyers. I've no problem with this because we have bats and flying foxes. We've got loads of flying stuff. I think there's even I know there's a fossil yeah. of a non-bird ancestor which has got four wings. Basically. So that's Microraptor. Well, there's there's several, Anchionis is another one, there's several that have big, long feathers on the hind legs, including stuff that looks asymmetric. Mm. There's a big question about whether they held all four limbs out in the same plane, like a kind of separate, slightly offset biplane. Like those frogs with the with the big... F- yeah, Wallace's frog, in fact. We'll get to those. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> probably Microraptor, and if, if Anchionis is gliding and other things, they're holding the legs under the body. Um, but again, these are all what we call passive flyers. They're, they're gliding rather than being capable of going up. So yeah, we're now talking about your inverted commas, flying frogs, flying geckos, flying snakes, <laughs> flying lemurs, which are of course not lemurs, um, flying squirrels, some of which are squirrels, some of which aren't, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And yeah, in, in terms of the passive flyers, yeah, there's huge numbers of them. There's a bunch of dinosaurs. There's a whole bunch of other extinct reptiles. There's at least one Mesozoic mammal, uh, Volaticotherium, which appears to be a little flying squirrel typed animal from the Jurassic. Um, I'm going to be saying Volaticotherium now for ages. It's a great a name. name. It's a bit like a sugar glider. Is that right? More know. or less, yeah. yeah. So, so a little flying squirrel or sugar glider type thing, um, basically preserved with a big slab of membrane. Um, so we're pretty happy it's a glider. Um, so yeah, there's loads of stuff like that knocking around. They're, they're not just the preserve of the modern world. Though they're very common. I think they're far more common than most people would realise. Which is the real evidence for like... Because I remember again, back in the day, this is one of my... Uh, maybe one of the essays in my finals was... I was very much taking the position that flight evolved from tree or cliff down rather than ground up, which I think most people think nowadays. But there was it was a bit more contentious back then. Some people thinking something like a goose 
you know, that kind of thing instead. And it's and it's obviously got more complicated since rather than simpler. Um, yeah. I can't remember if we've discussed this or not, but personally, I, I find the two somewhat synonymous because if you're in the trees and you get down to the ground, at some point you need to get back up. And if you're in the ground and you fly up into the trees, at some point you need to get back down. So the idea that going up and going down are somehow entirely separate from each other and only one of them could possibly drive the evolution of flight, I find questionable. But my, my question against that would be, first of all, I, well, um, to get all contemporary, the Venezuelan hutzin is one of my favourite birds and it basically has little hooks which it uses to climb trees. In the babies, in the juveniles, yeah, it's lost in the adult. But that, that would give you this sort of suggestion also, because it's in the juvenile, what you might be looking at is a kind of ancestral form. Loads of other stuff does it. The what the Watson's really derived and comes out deep in birds. I can't remember. It's one of those things that hops around all over the place. In so birds are a mess anyway, like modern birds and putting their phylogeny together. It, yeah, it's. If I heard this down the pub, Dave, I'd take great offence. Well, <laughs> birds are a real mess. <laughs> well, in some yeah. pubs, I haven't said yeah. that. You know, <laughs> depends what their licensing laws are like. We're talking about that that shift from passive to active flight, and how did that? go uh, and the argument certainly when I was an undergrad was that the origins of active flight are really problematic because unless you have it you know really well art, you know the joints all articulated in the right way and the wing surface built in the right way and all the rest of it you you get an evolutionary dip effectively where if you, you can imagine a gliding animal which is jumping off a tree and gliding to another tree and landing and it's getting better and better and better at doing that but it still hasn't got any motive way of getting speed or getting altitude and, and flapping to do that effectively you first of all need to pack on a bunch of muscle to start flapping your your wing whatever that wing may be but that's the problem it's unless you have everything in place packing on that extra muscle just adds dead weight almost you you you, you have the extra muscle you you flap like hell, but without all the, the right bits, you really don't gain very much and you've added loads of weight. And so now you're much heavier, so you don't glide as well as you used to. You don't make up your extra weight with the extra power output. So you actually become a less good flyer. And of course, evolution is unlikely to favour a less good flyer. So how do you get beyond that dip to go from this extra muscle and weight is useful in animals that are just gliding? And the solution to that is that they're probably doing something else as well. Um, I don't know how favoured it is in the community anymore, but the big thing 10, 12 years ago is a thing called where wing assisted incline running. Um, because basically baby birds can do this. Birds which have tiny little stubby wings and don't have proper wings yet, which is exactly what you'd expect of a inverted commas half evolved dinosaur and basically by flapping their wings actually they're effectively flapping backwards so by pushing air up they push themselves down but it means they can stick and run up vertical surfaces it's increasing and, traction isn't it yeah I, and you I can, really... it's, it's, ba it's basically like a formula one car so it can just it's sticking to the surface but of course, if you're a little sub-flying dinosaur, the ability to run up a vertical tree trunk or something like that is extremely useful coupled with gliding around. And then, of course, you have to flap to be able to do that. And so now you're flapping and you're getting use out of that muscle and you're doing the right flappy action, which could then, in theory, relatively easily be selected for and increase the flapping and increase the muscle and increase the surface area and then just shift how you're or flapping a bit and then suddenly when you next jump off the tree and you start hammering your wings up and down you're going up not down also very much enjoying a science podcast with the phrase the um a useful flappy action <laughs> that's the technical terminology isn't it no, I, was, I was just enjoying that because like i i i did i can see you now i, I see how you mean now there might be a, salt, a false distinction between them but like I really favoured the top down approach, mainly because of all those examples that we cited earlier, because gliding's so common. But but then I I was forced to actually back up the other one in a documentary series because we happened to be talking about that thing and I had to chase some chickens around like I was Rocky. <laughs> but yeah, so so you know, I, I can be sold. My opinions can be sold, basically. Yeah. I I, mean, I, th I think on average, you know, when I was doing this stuff, so late nineties, early two thousands, um, as a as a student, yeah, the, the trees down looked better because yeah, we we had stuff which looked very well suited to climbing around up in trees. 
and yeah. therefore you've the I guess the argument at that point is well if you're climbing and good at getting into trees you can see how they get themselves up and then it's a question of how do they change that gliding into flapping but of course then that was where you got that dip from which caused the problem yes. but it looked it, it initially looked obviously a much stronger case than ground up and the idea that they're literally just running around and jumping and flapping a bit and that somehow became flight and I'm not sure anyone ever put together a really credible case for, for how that would work. There was, there was, I remember there was a inverted commas pouncing pro avis model, which I really liked for a bit, which was the idea that you know these are all small carnivores and they're probably kind of like in the way that foxes like jumping into snowdrifts and things like that. They're kind of you know just getting into the lowest branch of a tree or a bush or up onto a big rock and then jumping down onto small prey. And then you could see, and the idea being therefore that a bit of steering on the way down and a bit of glide angle would be very useful yeah. but they only ever had to flap or fly to a very low height um i don't think that idea lasted very long but i, I remember it coming out in 2000 and i remember thinking oh that's quite a cool alternate and it's at least a bit more plausible than the idea that they're just running around holding their wings out for steering and then they flapped and they could fly at some point which i think was about the limit of the argument people gave <laughs> fun fact for the history nerds that's how achilles used to kill people he used to run and jump and stab straight down before they could get a good swing at him, so yeah. he could jump basically over his opponent. But did he use flap? Did he use flappy action? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the thing. I mean, if he had, it would have been, you know. Did he have winged sandals? We don't talk about his ankles. He's quite sensitive about. Well, them. I mean, I was, I was going to. I mean, Achilles could surely do whatever the hell he wanted. Since, I mean, the ankle aside, he was supposed to be invulnerable. In which case, surely <laughs> yeah. his fighting style is largely irrelevant because. People are presumably going to try and stab him in the head, and it's... I mean, just because you can't be killed doesn't mean you can't be injured. Ooh, that's interesting. But, but, but was that... It? I thought he was just generally invulnerable. He was just basically, if you read the original text as, I haven't, but my friend Natalie has. I was going to say, <laughs> <but> you haven't. <laughs> um, it, it's literally, it's just his speed. So he basically attacks before they, the battle's even started, you know. So he just goes in there, and his big move is he jumps and he stabs straight downwards um, through the collarbone into the lungs, the heart, that sort of thing, or attacks the head. But usually the head's um, covered, so it's usually just by the neck. Gets him there, lands, and they're dead, and he's won. He's ultimate champion. Anyway. It sounds like a bloody pole vault, actually, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Anyway, just just speed does it. So a big thank you to Simon Watts. You can follow him on Twitter. Uh, you can see all the things that he made. So do check out Simon. Um, listen to Level Up Human. Listen to watch. Go to his Twitter. Do all the things. He's an he's an amazing man. Are we? Uh, is there anything else you need to say about um, scientific papers? No, I mean I'm sure at one day we'll probably talk about getting hold of scientific papers for people who are interested in reading them, which is could easily fill another hour on the publishing industry. My my trick with that is if ever you want to read a paper, write to the person who wrote it. Yes, yes. <laughs> pe pe people don't seem to realise this is like you know, I'm I'm quite interested in people reading my research. I didn't write it to hide it away. I recommend doing that because, like, I'm 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 a comedian, so often I do read a lot of scholarly papers. <laughs> but you've got a lot of time to fill, so yeah. Well, exactly. I should be doing my own research, really. But my research tends to be peer reviewed by the people I'm experimenting on. So <laughs> the peer review is, "Hey, here's a joke," and the audience is like, "No, nah. yeah, no." Nah. <laughs> anyway, with that, um, and also, you can't trust, you know, even the most clever people to be accurate in their memory, because, like I say, my mum is a professor, and occasionally she will leave her keys in the fridge. <laughs> so, uh, with that, we will be back next week with actual dinosaurs. Rawr, rawr. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast, especially if you're a patron. Without you, we wouldn't have made this series. To be the first to hear bonus episodes and get extended interviews, please consider donating at patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube so you don't miss out on live broadcasts. All the links are available in the show notes or go to terriblelizards.co.uk. If you can't afford to support us financially, please do share this episode with your friends and leave us a review on your podcast app. Do say hello via social media or drop us an email, terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. We love hearing from you and we love to answer your dinosaur questions. 